So I understand everybody has a text. Huh? So again, just to make it clear, what is Bodhicitta? A kind heart. Who said the kind heart? Uh, no, it is part of it, but it's not. Kind heart is unfortunately not good enough. Seeking is not <laughs> extremely kind of heart. Uh, yeah. But there is another aspect that we are missing there. Uh, what is bodhicitta? What is bodhicitta? The inspiration to achieve enlightenment, to free all beings. To free to bring all beings to that all state. Beings to, with us to exactly. Only that is bodhicitta. The kind heart is not enough because the kind heart is very good. I'm not saying it's not good. But it goes like, you know, helping them now and not really knowing what is creating the suffering and all that. So, um, yeah, so it is the wish to, like, your, your far goal is to be able to help all beings. Your immediate goal is to clear up your confusion about reality, which prevents you from being liberated and enlightened. That's the, that's that. Even though you, at the moment, we're not too able to be benefit for sentient beings, so then we have to let go of that. But the wish to be free from uh, wrong views and ignorance, that one, that one should be there uh, all the time. Okay. Um, so the third, the fourth chapter, which here is called consciousness, can also call, be called introspection what I was inviting you to do in the reflection that we did, to really, really check, to really, really look inside. And it's such a big part of your, it would be a big part of your, if you're uh, <coughs> psychotherapy also. You need to know what's going on. You need to know your mind. You need to know what triggers it. And that is, a, is, that is actually what mindfulness is for, that you look without interfering. So we always interfere, we always want, you know, there is aversion towards something. Actually, we constantly, these two things, we want to be free of fear, and when fear is there, we kind of push it away. So introspection, consciousness, awareness, mindfulness, however you want to call it. Unfortunately, I don't speak Tibetan. Do you know the Tibetan, um, the Tibetan words for these two factors? You see, one factor is that sees it. The other factor is that corrects it. So there's two, it's two factors. This is why in chapter five he uses two factors. I don't know the Tibetan word for it. So this is why there's so many different um, different ways. Do, do you we, know? We One is tempa, I think. Tempa isn't it? is actually remembering. Yeah. Okay. Which is being being mindful. there. Yeah. Being mindful of your object. Of uh, it depends what again what the what the situation is exactly. or what the exercise is, what the what the attention is. Exactly. So, well, usually when they, when they do shamatha, the jempa is that you remember your object. Your object is not going away. The same way as when somebody harms us, we remember that object all day. <laughs> the mind is there, glued to it. So we can do it if there's interest. The only thing is that there's no interest in the breath or in your object or whatever. So you need to bring up that interest by knowing why you are doing it. You're not doing it to watch your breath. You're doing it to train the mind to be with the object. And here, especially in chapter 4, it is during the day to be mindful of your bodhicitta so that it does not decline. You know that you kind of, you are about to do an action and you go, hmm, is that the action of bodhisattva? Or no? Then you're able to kind of abstain from it. Now if you have twice a day, you would have that thought. I would think that would be incredibly good already. Yeah, and not just this weekend now, but if that's the training. To really check. Is this what I, is? Forget about bodhisattvas and bodhicitta. Is this what I want to be? The harming person, the inconsiderate person, uh, the selfish person. Is this what I want to be? If it's yes, then by all means, go ahead. Yeah, but then don't complain. People dislike you. Okay. Um, so like this. So it's kind of it's a self-reflection or, or introspection. 
so here it's like uh, this is a commentary by Pema Children, which is extremely good actually on the Porticaria Matana, Pema Children. And in German, it, I wrote it in German because uh, I teach in German usually in Switzerland. We have very good, very serious Porticaria Matana study group. We're only five people. We meet every second Tuesday and we discuss and how to apply that in your daily life and what happened. And, and we started maybe three years ago and it's still going very strong. And even when I'm not there, they do it without me. So, and they get a lot from it. They really get a lot from it because they apply and they get familiar with the verses. They also have to prepare themselves. Like, you know, somebody, we say, okay, next time. We're not saying this and this verse. We go in the speed that we need to go, which I find is really helpful. That you know, you don't need to cover it in one year. We just go, sometimes we don't even discuss one verse, we discuss what happened in the meantime, or something like that. So I find this very good. So then I use a few commentaries, like one is by Tenzin Zopa, Geshe Tenzin Zopa, the one from Hilgu, which you can download from the internet, by the way, his commentary. Very, very well also suited for the Western mind. Then there is uh, Geshe Eshi Topten. I think it's called the Path of the Warrior. Yeah, like, you know, Shantideva is king, you know, he's a prince, so that's why he uses that language. So again, if he would be born in a banker's family today, <laughs> he would use, um, you know, stock market, and uh, I don't know, he wouldn't use weapons and this, he would use other words, or if he would be a, a doctor. He would use other examples, but he uses warriors and examples from this time because he is from the caste of kings. So of course they had slaves. Yeah. Of course there are people, slaves working from the eighth century. Then there's another one by His Holiness, uh, like a flash of lightning in the dark, also a very nice commentary. And then Pema Children, which I think it's called It's Not Too Late. In German it's called It's Never Too Late. It's, it's nie zu spät. It's never too late. Could be something similar or something different. And it brings you the text really, really near because she kind of, you know, calms you down a bit because the text is quite harsh, as you then uh, might see. But she says, like, here how one uses um, conscientiousness is when Bodhicitta appears before we uh, commit to something, after we have committed to something, uh, when we have to deal with karmic results, and when we are uh, when we are kind of taken away by the relations, by the negative emotions. So this is in this case where you apply it. Yeah. So before you before you commit to bodhicitta. Then after you have committed to bodhicitta, to remember, to remind yourself, oh yeah, this is the commitment I made. Yeah. Then in your daily life, before you engage in activities, and uh, especially when the pleasures uh, kind of appear, and when in daily activities, also in daily life, when we have to deal with karmic results, and usually it's, we get upset when it's negative karmic results. You, you understand? So these are the situations where you would apply not brushing your teeth. doesn't say anything about brushing your teeth. Yeah. It's okay, you can train it there. But she actually, she also, she uses the example of mindfulness brushing your teeth because we're so used to brush teeth that yes, we are mindful at the beginning, but then the mind goes away. And all of a sudden you become aware again. So this is mindfulness, how you bring it back. You don't need to go, Ugh! you know, and then, Ugh! I need to bring it back. The moment you're aware that you're not on the object, you are back on the object, actually. So you don't need to make a big story out of it and get frustrated and stressed and all this. Yeah. So in the same way that all of a sudden you feel the, the brush against your teeth again, you're with the object in a very natural way. But in a very natural or in a very habitual way, also, the mind can totally move away, and you are brushing your teeth, but yeah, or you're very familiar with the with the with here with the place here. You come to this place, you have noticed anything from your room to here. You were totally lost in thoughts. Yeah, that was okay. So pleasure is a very strong emotion that necessarily will lead to suffering. 
That is what is called pleasure. So I will use, instead of always negative emotion, flicking and blah, blah, I also in Switzerland started the word pleasure, so people are, know what I'm talking about. A very strong force that gives us energy, that drives us to do something, that pushes us to do something, but it distorts, it exaggerates. Aggression, it just exaggerates the negative sides. Um, desire, it exaggerates the positive sides and it puts kind of the, the, I have this object, this situation or this person, I will be happy. That's wrong because you were happy before you knew that person or that situation or that object. It's only when the need, you know, you meet the object and the need comes up, ooh, I need this to be happy, then the, the karmic force comes and, and wants it and creates the wrong image of the, of the thing. With, with desire, you always end up being disappointed, always. Either when the desire goes, it's not what you ex imagined it to be, or you die and you still the object of the person is still there. You die is a lot of suffering if you have attachment. Or you lose interest in the person or in the in the object. Yeah, so these three things happen with desire and it's disappointment all, every time. And disappointment would be a good thing. You see, we should be really we should stay with our disappointments and maybe use the word disenchantment because these pleasures, they paint a picture of the object, the personal situation that is not true. It's like a spell. We are overcome by a spell and we, oh, we totally believe it. And then we suffer when we don't have the situation or the, or the sit situation of the person. And we don't even look if there would be something else that is available. We're totally focused on that thing because this is what Shempa does. It's this very strong energy, that kind of, Make, forces you to go there, forces you to stay there. Um, so, so then disenchantment would be would mean oh now I see, it's not true. For example, you'd never got the object and you forget about the object. You go like oh, I can survive without the object. It's okay. If you if, you know if your desire leaves you alone for a while, if you nourish it with thoughts how wonderful this person is, or this object is, of course it, 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 won't, it won't get milder, it will, it will stay there, and that's what we usually do, we kind of give him fuel with our thoughts. Yeah? Uh, but if, if for a while maybe you forget about the person, or the situation, or whatever, and all of a sudden you say, oh, I'm quite happy. Oh, what's going on? So, ah, it's not true, I can be happy without that person. Or when, um, when you are unhappy because the object is there, then you go, oh, probably also not true that having the object or the situation is happiness. Yeah, so this is how you use it in order to, in order to, to, to break that spell. Yeah. So the word, German word is enttäuschung for this, this disappointment. Enttäuschung. Enttäuschung means um, deception. Ent means no deception anymore. So we go, oh, now I'm so entourished. Instead of going, wow, <laughs> the deception is gone. I see clearly. There's a song like this. No, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. So we can see, I can see clearly now the pleasure is gone. <laughs> we can start singing that. Um, so pleasures also get, they, they, they developed out of like very, um, very subtle tensions. Like not having what we want, having what we, you know, these things that we don't, we don't feel, and then shempa and then pleasure. It's like it, it goes together. It doesn't come like like this one after the other. It goes very very quick. But this is how how they kind of work together. Yeah. Like uh, this is why it's so important that you learn to relax. But again, relaxation is not like this. It's a relaxed mind, which then if the mind is not relaxed and the body gets tense, and I'm talking about subtle tensions that like muscles that you hold face shoulders very often also when you sit on the floor because we think we need to give the spine more strength we think we have to pull the the buttocks and the thighs together in order to sit upright no you just have to write find the right place and then it will sit by itself so if you're young please train 
it will really help to make your mind clear. If you're old and you're like me and I can't, I slowly, slowly can start sitting on the floor again. Slowly, slowly, 20 minutes or so, so it's great. It's a huge difference whether you sit on, leaning on the wall or on the chair and leaning towards the back, or if you sit upright. It makes a huge difference for your mind state. So if you're not trained, you, if you don't train it, you will never learn. And the Geshe Sonam Rinchen at the library he used to say, looking at us Westerners, kind of everybody, you know, first the walls are taken, and then only <laughs> afterwards that. And he did say, he said, gosh, if you can't even, and we, you know, people in India in his class, they're usually young. If you can't get your body right, how are you ever going to get your mind right? Now, if we don't even put effort into, it's very clearly said how one should sit in meditation, and we don't. Yeah. Then when you are getting older and you and your back aches and all this is not possible, then you relax for a little while, but then you come back up again. But this becomes such a habit. And it's not conducive for a clear mind. It's really not conducive. So if it's at all possible, sit freely. You know, when I started meditating, I was 40. Many of you are younger than 40. I had my legs up here. I couldn't bring them down. And then slowly, slowly, slowly. Also, I didn't notice it. Maybe after two years, I thought, oh, my knees are on the floor. But I was in India, so we didn't have that many walls, and I'm from Switzerland, I don't fight. So I would, from the beginning, to sit in the middle somewhere, because I didn't want to fight for the places next to the wall. So I learned how to sit by force. I mean, there was no other way. So, so like this. So where do these um, tensions come from? It, they come from our dualistic kind of dualistic uh, appearances, that I and others. These are there and not connected to the mind. This is um, this is what it is. And then there is it comes to it spirals into pro and contra. This is good. This is bad. This is good. Therefore, I want it. And then I don't have it. Then more tension. Yeah. This is bad. I don't want it. And if I have it, uh, 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 more tension. So this is what the mindfulness is for to release these tensions. Also, you know, the first moment of. You relax. It's amazing how it becomes a habit, and the, the habit can be so strong that you don't even notice anymore that you do it. Whenever I have to queue up, and the, the queue is very long, I don't even notice that I'm going to my breath very automatically. It takes me a while to say, oh, I'm on the breath. And I also see that it helps, oh, just wait, you know. So it, it really, the same way as we're habituated of not being aware, you become habituated of being aware, and then it goes automatic, and you don't have to think about it. But it's training. Yeah. So for little cues, I do that. For the longer ones, I don't know. It's a way of, mm, so, you know. So, but anyway. So these pro and contrast, then that, this escalates very quickly into aggression and, and uh, Aggression, <coughs> desire, and what's gear? greed, ignorance, uh, jealousy, pride, and so on. So, um, so what is at the root is this wrong view of that things exist not influenced by the mind. When I say not separate from the mind, people think that nothing exists out there. So maybe that's for the beginning. It's a bit too much, but. Things out there, they do not exist, not influenced by my mind. My mind is creating them the way I see them. If I would be an aunt, not an aunt, an ant, or it depends where you, which country you're from. <laughs> the little animals that are, how do you call them in Hebrew? Because you wrote the nemalim. The nemalim. If I would be a nemalim, this definitely wouldn't be a watch. The nemalim would, would label this in a totally different way. Maybe. Maybe a protection, maybe a hindrance on its path, I don't know. Yeah, so we don't know. So this is how our mind creates, actually. If you want to have a creator, it's your mind who is the creator. The, our mind creates reality, our mind creates good and bad. I mean, a good example is masochists. They pay money so that they get abused and then they experience pleasure. Because why? Because they label it pleasure. So what is it? You know, or me and my father with cheese. For him it was pleasure, for me it was torture. So is cheese because abuse is a bit too strong to discuss this in a group? Yes. So yeah, it is. I, but it's, uh, think about it. 
So the cheese becomes pleasure, you label it pleasure, it becomes pleasure. You label it kind of abuse because my father forced me to eat it, it becomes eating cheese is abuse. He didn't abuse me, so he didn't try so many times, but it might be three, four times, and I felt horrible. I had to vomit afterwards. But he did it out of concern for me because he thought I don't see the pleasure because I don't eat it. So was sitting in front of me going, ah, oh, it's nice, ah, oh, it's nice. And I was going, like, ooh. <laughs> okay. So the force of these clashes, we try to kind of reduce them with mindfulness. This is what we're trying to do here. Okay, so the first verse goes having having firmly seized Polichita in this way. A conqueror's son must never waver, always should he exert himself to never stray from this practice. Okay, here says son. Oh, then some people get upset, so then in the newer tra translations it's children. So in my German translation it's the, the, the children of the jinnas who have taken this uh, bodhicitta firmly in their hand, they should um, continuously and without getting tired, without getting tired, um, the follow the teachings of bodhicitta. Doesn't say do it, but you know, listen to teachings, putting them into practice and so on. So it's pretty much the same here except here for his sons. The conquerors are the Buddhas. So why are they called conquerors? What have they conquered the Buddhas? Not the whole mind can kind of, the clashes, exactly, and especially the wrong views. That's why they're called conquerors. Those are brave people. People who go for their mind, not the ones who destroy outer enemies. These are, you know. Also Shanti Deva in one of the chapter in one of the verses he says, There's no point killing your outer enemies. They will die by themselves. Why you go and kill them? They will die like everybody else. <laughs> so makes so much sense in a way. They will die anyway. Huh? Me? Yeah, yeah, it's, you'll see it in, I think it's, it's in chapter 7 or 6. One of the things that he says. Like, you know, unlike the Tibetans, I know a few verses, but I don't really know where they fit. I don't need the number of it, nor the page, not even the chapter sometimes. Uh, okay, so that's clear, okay? Once we have made the decision, that's it. A lot of our interest and energy and time should go there. And usually I don't use the word should, but this is for once you make a decision. Because you know how it is. You make a decision and then you kind of the next day you go, uh, I wonder if that was a good thing to do. And it takes out all the energy from making the decision. And then again you hold back and then you feel terrible. And you go again, this pro and contra and this and this. You never know what comes out. You just, sometimes you just, okay, let's do it. And you do it, yeah? So this is why, you, you know, make it very strong. Be aware that once you make a decision, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. And you know, helping others now and all this, we will get discouraged and we will, all this, it's again. We, but it, it doesn't matter so much. Not giving up completely and saying, okay, I'll stop completely with this whole thing. You know, there's moments where you feel really inspired and you actually put it into practice and then there's other moments you can't, you go, what is up, am I, you know, kind of. But, so, the main thing is not to give it up completely. <coughs> okay, uh, second verse. In the case of reckless actions or of deeds not well considered, Although a promise may have been made, it is fit to reconsider whether I should do them or not. In the case of reckless action, I need to not well consider it. Although a promise may have been made, it is fit to reconsider whether I should do them or not. <coughs> okay, so that means you have to um, you have to think if you really if you really want to do it, and then look forward. Yeah. Because uh, it's not an easy, it's not an easy decision. That one. But how can I ever withdraw from what has been examined by great wisdom of the Buddhas and their sons, and even many times by me myself? So that goes back to the first chapter. 
that you you have thought about this bodhicitta, you have heard about bodhicitta, you've seen people like Gajan and Virgil comes next week who live bodhicitta, or like other, like the Dalai Lama, Lama Zopal in um, Tema Lodger in who came here, you know, his body was already kind of really not good, he needed a wheelchair and all this, he took it upon himself to come to Israel. And I still remember, I mean, uh, he was prostrating, and you could see how much pain he had in his body prostrating, and Leora Price, who is our um, crier from <laughs> my birth, kind of thing, our professional crier, yeah, she, you know, her tears come very easily, she was standing next to me, and she went, Oosh! and she started crying, I took her hand, I said, stop it, he's not suffering, he wants to prostrate, yeah? So, but you could see it, it was difficult, but, yeah, but kind of he still did it. So, when you see people like this who don't care about their body, they prostrate because they want to, with the body, they want to make homage to the Buddha, because they see the benefit of it, whether they have pain or not, they don't care. To be, in, instead of being this wrong compassion, instead of being full of compassion for infantry, you should be kind of admiration to think, wow, I want to become like that. We had one monk in Dharamsala, he had, um, he had a really, you know, they have really bad two teeth because they don't go to the dentist, so then it's extraction when it's, too, when it's really painful. Or sometimes they fall out themselves. It was Tashi who was living next to a house, next to Tushita, the house was leaking and, you know, he was doing retreats in there and it was very simple and it was moldy. And it, he said, no, I won't go because I run the danger, I can't pronounce the mantra properly anymore. So he preferred to have the toothache than to not to be able to recite the mantras properly. So you can be inspired by this, and you can only be, you see, when I tell you the story, you can't be inspired by this because we, you don't know the people. But when you see the people, when you live with them, when you see how relaxed they are and how courageous and how totally unfaced by these, the roof is leaking, okay, so it's leaking, so well, I can sit, you know. I can go sit somewhere else. These kind of things. Then maybe you'll be inspired by it. Yes, sir. I want to ask a question. I hope it is relevant. For the well, if it's not relevant, then I'll write it down, maybe. I think it is relevant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it doesn't do any harm. Uh, Garchan Rinpoche is a very... Uh, uh, he, he's like an almost enlightened person, if not enlightened. I, I don't know. know. And he's he doesn't say. He would say, I'm just a simple monk. Yeah, and he is very sick. So what my question is like, uh, he does he have a lot of positive uh, merits and karma, and also bad karma for being sick? Okay, the bad karma is they need to take a human body. Okay, the, the question was, so Gajan Rinpoche is very sick. I don't know in what state he is at the moment. Is he really very sick? He's in just old. Pain. Yeah, well, he's old also, you know, and he's been in prison for 17 years, he's been tortured for 17 years. So, of course, he's or even more, I mean, his body is not so well. Uh, you get, you know, this has kind of effects, after effects, if you are treated like this, no proper food and all this. So, but look at him, look at his mind. He doesn't complain, he's not unhappy, so that's what I mean. But, uh, so... If he's a Buddha, they wouldn't say that he's a Buddha. Again, don't try to understand this too well here. Don't make it too worldly, this whole thing. If he is a Buddha, uh, which he wouldn't say, he takes on the aspect of suffering so that we can generate maybe compassion or also that he becomes ordinary. He needs, in order for us to make contact with the Buddha, they need to have a body that we can see. So it's a human body, right? That's what they do, or maybe sometimes in order for us to generate compassion, they take on the body of a suffering dog. So that at least we have some compassion when we see the dog who is suffering. Okay? So if he's a Buddha, his karma is finished. Yeah? So they, what, what do they say? So they, 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 they feel the pain, but they don't really experience it, or the other way around. Like, you know, they don't suffer. Okay, they experience the pain, but they don't suffer. Okay? So if you see the Dalai Lama also, you know, I mean, he's 82, he's sitting cross-legged for two hours without moving. It takes him time until he can walk again when he gets up. Uh, and when he was in Switzerland, I was actually surprised. It looked as if he's sitting 
cross-legged on a throne, but they had just made a very high table, and he was sitting like this, like me, but it, because he's always sitting cross-legged, I thought he was sitting cross-legged. So if, if they are...